This is Pine Talk. On a mountain, in a secluded, monk-inhabited village, a statue of a penguin stands proudly. At the base of that statue, a plaque that reads, His Honor, Porky of the Pine. Damn, are we getting into Judge Judy or something here? Hey, my, my name's Brian, also known by 33YN2. I'm boring. Welcome to Pine Talk. I do have to give all of the credit of that intro to our editor Zed. He wrote it when he was editing our last episode. I'm definitely not pursuing a uh, legal career, but um, what we definitely are getting into, rapid fire. The keyboard driver in Meggie's kernel has been updated to allow for checking the battery voltage using SysFS in the terminal, and it allows you to set what wattage a keyboard case should deliver to the Pine phone. Plasma Mobile Gear 22.02 has released. This includes a revamped task switcher and quick settings panel, an improved app drawer, the phone will now no longer go into suspend when you set it to never go into suspend, and there have been many other bug fixes and UI improvements. With this current progress, there will be plenty more improvements and fixes to look forward to in the next release. There's already been a couple of major features that are ready for landing in the next Plasma Mobile Gear release. SXMO versions 1.8.0, 1.8.1, and 1.8.2 have all released within the past month. Version 1.8.0 features many changes to config files, hooks, and processes to make SXMO cleaner and more efficient. There have been changes to the status LED that now results in blinking to indicate the screen has been either turned off or that crust is active rather than the light staying on consistently. So if you turn off your screen in SXMO and the LED isn't there at all times, it's okay, it will periodically blink, and your phone has not turned off. And also, the Bluetooth menu has been completely revamped. In version 1.8.1, there were changes to the config migration between updates, they fixed an issue where DWM was not starting due to xinit missing, and they added support for the Big PP's hardware buttons. And then in 1.8.2, they fixed an issue which would suddenly disable some touch input on Sway, and they finally changed the default text editor from this to vim. Postmarket OS Stable version 21.12 Service Pack 2 was released. This included an update for Chatty to version 0.6.1, an update for Fosh to 0.15, and it also included SXMO 1.8.2. There's also been a new release for Arch Linux ARM, which included Linux kernel 5.16.8, an update to MMSD, and many UI-specific updates and tweaks for Fosh, Plasma Mobile, and SXMO. Victorg's custom modem firmware has been updated to version 0.5.9, which includes many small tweaks and various features for modem automation. The Pine Note has come a very long way in a very short period of time. KDE Plasma Desktop now runs on it with a specific grayscale theme. Postmarket OS has been ported to it and features both Fosh and SXMO UIs. All of the device hardware works, including pen pressure. And here I was thinking that I could wait maybe about a year to buy one. At this rate, I'm going to need one next month, and I'm going to be in dire need of one. Community member LLL Sondo LLL, I'm sorry if I butchered your name, I don't know how to pronounce that, or the best way that that could be pronounced, used a Galaxy S20 external battery case for their PinePhone Pro, which had an 8500 milliamp hour battery in it, and with that, their PinePhone Pro lasted two days without charging, with suspend completely disabled. Now, it doesn't fit perfectly, however, the community has made 3D printed shims that will help secure the phone in that case, and we have included a link to that forum post for those listening. And finally, there is going to be a new European Pine64 store run by everyone's favorite community manager, Lucas. This will launch in either April or May, and you'll be able to choose between Postmarket OS, Mobian, or Manjaro as a default operating system on any Pine phone you buy from this store, and all of the proceeds will result in a donation to your chosen distribution. So before anything else, I want to mention the elephant in the room. Suspend now works on the PinePhone Pro if you have 11 boot flash to the SBI flash memory. So it seems whatever was causing problems with Suspend is related to U-Boot on the PinePhone Pro. And by not using U-Boot, the problem is solved and you are able to put the device into Suspend. Now, 11 boot is a lot better than just using U-Boot on the MMC memory, for example, or using U-Boot that's on the SD card that comes with the distribution image that you flash to that, right? because of the fact that it flashes to the SBI flash chip inside the PinePhone Pro, and it can handle booting from any media source without needing the distribution to have a custom configured U-boot that would be installed to the SD card or EMMC memory. That means also that it allows you to choose to boot from what media source you want to. So instead of before where it would just boot to EMMC constantly, now you have the option 
to boot to SD card if you wanted to and bypass EMMC because Levin Boot is you know the one that's managing the booting process. It's no longer just the EMMC memory that's boot booting and then handling booting, obviously. Now keep in mind Levin Boot is still being worked on. It's not ready yet, per se. It's still a merge request, basically. So you can go and get the image and try it out, but it's still not completed yet. It's still being worked on. Um, I don't know exactly what's to be worked on, and I don't know what will come, but if you feel that you don't want to live on the edge, then it's probably not the best idea to try it out now. I don't think it's a bad thing to try it out, though, because it does come with an installer that flashes. So let's say in the future a new version comes out and you want to upgrade to that, it should just be as easy as running a, the new installer and flashing to the SBI chip, and it'll overwrite the old version. Um, so there shouldn't be any problems, but again, if you're not sure, then maybe it might be best to wait in, until it comes out fully with a version 1.0 release kind of thing. Now, one of the great things about it, aside from being able to boot generic ARM64 images or booting from any kind of media source, such as EMMC memory or SD card, or even like in the future, possibly like USB devices plugged into the phone, it has a built-in jump drive-like feature that allows you to access the EMMC storage and flash it or copy over files. So you could directly mount it to your computer, basically, do everything you need to do, and then unplug it and reboot the device, and voila, you've done everything you need to. You don't have to worry about using some installer or you know, grabbing an SD card and running off of that and then using DD onto the EMMC to erase it and then flash the image onto there using the PinePhone Pro. You could just plug it into a computer and call it a day when you use the 11 boot jump drive like feature. Now, I'm not 100% sure what key binding you press to access that feature. I believe it's like power up, you hold it down and then you let it go at some point. I'm not sure. I'm sure there's documentation on the GitHub where you get the image in the first place. But regardless, this is a huge feature to have. And in other news, although technically this is old news that was just talked about in this month's update. You can now flash and update your PinePhone Pro's modem using firmware up D, so FWUPD. This is huge as it makes upgrading to BigTorque's custom modem firmware safer and easier than ever. As for choosing to install it, do not quote me, but I believe the custom modem firmware currently does have issues with GPS. It doesn't have AP, a GPS data functionality, I believe which means it will be much, much slower at getting a fix for your location. So keep that in mind. It's not, you know, the custom modem firmware is not ready yet. You know, it's still kind of a in-development thing, but this is a huge step towards getting it ready for people to just be able to flash it and call it a day, and it's safe, and it's easy to do so, and they don't have to worry about anything, at least once, you know, the firmware is ready for the public to install. Now, that said, do keep in mind that Pine64 is not endorsing this firmware at all. If you install it, you choose to do so at your own risk. There. I believe it also voids your warranty as well, unfortunately. So doing so, obviously Pine64 does not encourage it. They don't support it. They legally can't do so. So keep that in mind. In other exciting news, Martin Bram of Post Market West fame has started working on advanced image processing for his Megapixels application. This includes automatic color processing and image stacking, which greatly improves the sharpness of images and gets rid of noise in a more natural way. He has stated in the blog post how he has achieved this, and what work is needed to get this added into megapixels. But we'll leave a link for you to check it out. Now, Brian, I'm, I'm seeing something here in the script. Um, you being a, a proponent of free and open source software, you're, do you have an idea about a proprietary hardware device? Uh, hello? What? Google Glass, really? Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Not, not, not advising proprietary Google Glass at all. Editor's note, I'm going to interrupt Brian here and just say what he was trying to say. This is an idea he had that he thought was neat. It's not endorsed or created by Pine64 in any way, and you shouldn't associate it with them. Thanks. So everyone remembers Google Glass, right? Uh, unfortunately, yeah. The bone conduction audio that would allow you to hear you know, instructions from the device, the microphones that had noise cancellation that allowed you to give commands in a, an environment, you know, so when you're outdoors, there's sounds around you, it would still be able to pick up your, your commands and be able to do stuff. And then it had the glass prism in front of your face that would go in front of your glasses and allow you to see a little display that it gives you information. It's kind of like a heads up display for you in the real world, right? Kind of like an RPG, but now you can get all that information on your face. Well, 
Google, it, it was a great technology. I mean, it had cameras, it had bone conduction, mic can noise canceling microphones, it had a, a neat little display. But Google really kicked the pooch with the design of that thing. Not because the design itself was bad, but because of the design of the software. Like they, they had so much potential and just didn't go for it. And then on top of that, they had a really high price for it, like an asking price that was way over the hardware value, I'm sure of it. Like there's no way that thing was that much money when you break down the individual hardware bits. I mean, maybe just like they trying to make up for the lost R&D of their employees kicking around all day and not doing shit, but I have no idea. Um, so my pitch is it would be amazing to have a Pine 64 Google Glass type device, you know, like Pine Glass, let's say, or something, right? Yeah, I was about to say Pine Glass. So this Pine Glass idea, right? What, what would this be? Well, we all know we already have the Pine Time. We already have the Pine Phone. Well, okay, those are great devices, but they're not perfect. Let's say when you're driving, well, I mean, a lot of cars that are newer do have inbuilt displays that give you driving directions and stuff, but they're still down below on the dashboard. You have to kind of look down still. Having a heads-up display that could give you directions while you're driving would be really great. You know, you could look at right in front of your view, still see the road, and get directions at the same time. You could listen to music using the bone conduction headphones, which I have a pair of Aftershocks, Aero, Aeropex Aftershocks Pros, and those things are amazing. They, they work really well. They don't have as much bass as normal headphones. Editor's note. Yeah, he said bass. And they are a bit pricey, but... They sound really good. They work really well, and they're Bluetooth as well. But who's to say we can't combine that? You know, have a a Google Glass type display with a little prism and and an OLED display that you know, because these these displays, the way that they work is they use mirrors and glass, and they project a OLED display, a tiny little OLED, onto the mirror that bounces onto the glass, and then the glass angles it towards your vision, so you could see in the what appears to be the glass box, but what's really happening is the light is coming out of the prism into your eye. Um, is a little image in front of you. Um, it would be amazing to have that. You know, you could make it so it's it's on a hinge. You could like fold it backwards so it's out of your view if you want it out of the view, or fold it forwards and, and adjust it kind of thing. Have the bone conduction audio. Have microphone or at least a microphone, right? So at least when you're in a quiet car, you could still talk to it and give it directions and stuff like, um, you know, glass. You know. I'm not going to say Google because obviously, you know, we would like want to do something like Mycroft or something. You know, this is an open source idea, right? Um, like Glass, get me directions to, and then it would use like open street maps to try and get you directions to somewhere, right? Um, all this stuff is possible broken down, right? The biggest issue though is for a hobbyist, um, I mean, this was the same kind of thing that blocked us from making Pine Times or making Pine Phones back when, before Pine64 made these things was that to make this stuff on your own, is pretty much impossible. You can't get the hardware small enough and you can't get it compact. That requires actual engineering to do so and manufacturing of capabilities. And Pine64 has that. So, you know, this if there's demand for this kind of product, if if there's interest in it, they could they could potentially do it if they put their mind to it, right? Um now there is questions of cost, there is questions of, you know, what kind of software stack would run on this thing. What kind of processor would you use for it? I think there is a couple options now in in the modern day like, you know, the BL602 or the BL706 I think it is, which is a higher end version of that that has things like image processing and audio capabilities as well added to it. So it's a little low power microcontroller that can do a lot of stuff like image processing and audio and all those kind of things. And if you add on a Bluetooth connection, you could use the gadgets you already have. Like imagine this. So Google Glass had a haptic sensor on the right side of it that allowed you to swipe and press to, you know, interact with the UI of the, the display. Having a Bluetooth connection, you could sync it up to your Pine Time and or sync it to your Pine Phone as well, even, or you know, sync it to your Pine Phone, which is synced to your Pine Time, so you know they can interact using an app, right? Or and your Pine Note or Pine Book or Pine Tab. Well, yeah, I mean, any devices at that point could interact with it, but yeah. let's, let's say for the portability aspect, your Pine phone would be the main processing device, right? It syncs up through Bluetooth to the headset, and so the microcontroller is capable on its own, right? It's, it can do at least some basic tasks like display an image and maybe take a picture and save it to storage somewhere, that kind of thing, because like the higher-end BL706, I believe, does have the capabilities to do that, and even if not... There's maybe the potential, like, the RK3566 processor, you know, maybe there's a cut-down version of that, or maybe it could be down-clocked or something, so it's really low power and can still do that kind of stuff. I mean, there's a lot of 
processor choices on the market now that have some open source software support. And imagine this though, you could use the Pine Time as like a capacitive touch panel if you wanted to. So you could do swipe directions, you know, left and right and that kind of thing and interact with the UI on your head. So you could be driving and, you know, just put your finger on your wrist while you're paying attention to the road, right? And just swipe real quick. So that way you can interact with the display without, without ever looking down. Um, you could have your Pine phone for interacting with the device and doing processing and stuff as well. And all of this would be running open source software. So you could write your own apps for this thing. Unlike Google, I mean, Google Glass did have an app system, obviously. I believe it ran Android, actually. So it, it was somewhat flexible, but it was always limited in that Google set up the framework for this thing. They had proprietary firmware for it and everything. It wasn't like an open source project where you could change the operating system if you wanted to, to something completely different or make your own app that does anything you want because there's no limits to open source. Basically, if you have the knowledge and understanding, you could write any kind of software you want for this thing, make it do anything you want. So there's a lot of potential here though. If somebody wanted to, they could do image processing on the phone to, for example, you know, do AR related stuff. They could do basic AR. Now the Pine phone isn't the most powerful, but Pine phone pro, or maybe even a future Pine phone, because those obviously will come down the line. There's, there's huge potential to be able to do processing on those and, you know, get really advanced image processing and, you could do, you could take images hands-free, take videos hands-free, do like, I don't know, voice calls, for example, using open, like Jitsi, for example, that would, you know, I'm sure there's ways to do that as well. I mean, I'm not very familiar with the software stack of this kind of stuff. So maybe there's problems and in, in roadblocks that would prevent this from happening. But ideally there would be lots and lots of things that this thing could do that Google Glass never explored, that never happened, you know? And it would be really cool if Pine64 were to look into this kind of product. I mean, I don't know if there's a market for it though. I mean, a lot of the, it's obviously this isn't something that everybody says I must need like a phone. They're like, I need that because I need to place calls and communicate with people. A device like this isn't something that you absolutely need. Again, though, to be fair, something like the Pine Note isn't something that people need. So, and there's still a lot of interest in that, right? What there, do you mean? I need a pine nut. <laughs> there's, there's applications to it that make it interesting to people, especially when it has open source involved. I mean, look at other Kindles, like, or let, let's look at other e-reader devices, like Kindles, for example. People, I, I mean, people are going to the Pine Note, for example, because it runs open source software. That's the whole appeal to it is it's a really good piece of hardware, but then it also has open source software on it, which allows you to open the gates to do anything you want. Whereas before Amazon only allowed you to just do like bare, bare bones web browsing, for example, and only access eBooks with their store, for example. Now you could do anything you want, use any kind of UI. And the same thing would apply to the, you know, a, a Google Glass to type device by Pine64. You could run any kind of software you want on it and do any kind of tasks you want. It's up to you what you want to install on it, what you want to do with it. And the best of all, in my opinion, is that it would have privacy, obviously, by nature of the software not phoning home to Google and sending all that information back to them. There's a lot of extra privacy to the device like this. And yes, I, I realize, again, it's not going to be something that everybody needs, but I think I think there is a niche market for this kind of thing. And I would be interested to know if the audience here has the kind, same kind of feelings. Would you be interested in a device that has a heads-up display like the Google Glass that uses either a piece of glass that goes in front of your glasses or maybe even like a pair of smart glasses that have a built-in display of some kind, like a transparent OLED or something, that kind of thing. You know, the style of device where you could look in front of you still, but you get a display there as well that you could see. And of course, maybe it's not going to be anything like ultra HD or, you know, like a 4k screen, it's, it's not going to be that probably. Right. But it will be more than enough to see like some basic information, get things done, you know, get navigation instructions, maybe, you know, see, uh, like, like one of the biggest things for this, I could see aside from navigation while driving or, um, showing notes while you're doing an activity or something, instructions, that kind of thing would be teleprompting. Like doing a recording, you could get teleprompts in front of you that say like, you know, in other news, blah, 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 blah. And you could read it out word by word. That's, that would be extremely helpful for some people. Um, it could also have huge accessibility benefits as well. I mean, live translation, like Google demonstrated, I'm, uh, that's probably not something that would come right away. It'd be a lot of work. 
Um, that's a very complex thing, but I am sure that there are open source libraries that would allow that to be a possibility. Um, yeah, and I'm thinking like Firefox's translation. Don't they have one that's open source and everything? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's for other languages as well, but either way, even if it's not for other languages, like a, a, another language, it could still be useful for, say, like, Opening the app that, you know, reads what's on the camera and give, and turning into text, you know, doing image to text translation. And then you could, like, look at a piece of paper and have it translate as much as possible. And obviously there'll be errors because no technology like that is perfect. But that would be extremely useful to transcribe stuff in a quick manner. And, you know, I think it is more than possible, especially at that point, if you can transcribe stuff from, t you know, image to text, you could do translation as well, which would be extremely useful. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, what's your thoughts, Porky? I mean, I think this is a device that has a lot of potential and I think Pine64 should explore that. I, I mean, I, obviously I'm not part of them. I can't tell them what to do or anything like that, but I think this would be a really interesting idea and I think it would go really well with their other smart devices and ecosystem. Yeah. So for all that I talked down on Google Glass, um, I actually was really interested when I first heard about it and I was, I would have bought into it, um, had it not been a disaster all around and it not actually really even making it to consumer hands for the most part. Um, but the one thing that I would really want out of a Pine 64 glass equivalent um, is something I would, I'd probably write the app myself unless someone w uh, wanted to beat me to the punch because I'm not an amazing developer. Uh, it would uh, look at everyone around me and it would scan them and give me their power level. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, there's a DIY glass projects online that, like, this is why I think this is more than feasible, too, um, is because those DIY projects that use literally just a, a Raspberry Pi Zero, for example, with a OLED display and some pieces of glass and a mirror, right? They, they still work really well, considering they are bulky, but there's ways to reduce the size of those. You can shrink them down quite a bit and make them more, you know, approachable. Now, with manufacturing, that would be even better. You know, you could um, make the PCBs really small and compact if you have proper engineering and manufacturing. And that, that I think, is where the potential will lie, making a small, compact. And, you know, it might be a bit expensive for, you know, uh, how much tech is packed into this thing. But I, I think there would still be a pretty bar big market as long as it's not above like maybe $200 or $300, that kind of thing, right? Um, something like this has a lot of uses, especially for companies. I mean, that's why Google Glass is not 100% dead. For the public, yes, it's 100% dead. But for enterprise, there's still a lot of uses because displaying information in front of you and get while you're doing something, so you have both hands free and being able to interact with the environment and still ask questions and get information is insanely useful. Yeah, I actually do think that there is enough of a market for something like this to exist. Because, um, I mean, if it came out, I would definitely be interested. Or if it was announced, I'd be extremely interested in it, and I would want to um, possibly tinker with development for it. Um, I say that with everything, though, so and I haven't really developed anything. So <laughs> I guess I can't yeah. really talk too much to that. But um, I'd at least, you know, have it's the thought that counts, I guess. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, for somebody that has the knowledge, they already have yeah. a step into the door with this kind of technology, you know, where, where it's open like that. Uh, assuming it's approachable, I mean, there is, like, you know, if this is a really low-level kind of device where, like, the cameras, you know, until there's software written to make things easier to interface with, then, yeah, obviously it will be limited to a lot more experienced people. But um, I think it will get, like... Any, I mean, with any Pine64 device, it's always been like like the Pine Time, for example. But things have gotten easier over time because libraries are made to make things easy and accessible and stuff. And, you know, the there's a really dedicated community of hardcore developers who have the vision, you know, that everybody else does and are like, I, I want to make that happen, you know? They're, they're willing to spend their time to make these magical things in, in our eyes, right, happen because they want it as well. Um, and that's the key is that, you know... Um, Making a device like this, unlike Google Glass, where it was motivated by profit, motivated by, um, you know, trying to create a, a, a market for itself and carve out a new monopoly, like making this Pine64, making this device would be for the people, right? It wouldn't be for a monopoly or anything like that. I mean, sure, they might stand to make a few bucks off of it, 
Um, I mean, they, they have a small profit margin with a lot of their devices, but it wouldn't be anything spectacular. And their main you know, goal making this stuff is because they think it's interesting and because their community thinks it's interesting and that there is people who want to write software for these cool devices. And what you're saying with the development of it, uh, you could just take the Pine Note, for example. There was literally no way to get a e-ink output on Linux. And they figured that out. They, and now, now that we have that, we are rapidly gaining, the Pine Note's rapidly improving to the point, like I said in the rapid fire, by next month, it might be a perfect or a near perfect tablet that anyone could just use. You know, anyone with some Linux experience. And I mean, there's no other devices on the market that are like that. I mean, as far as I know, at least, there's really no other alternatives to that. You know, you can't really get a laptop or something that's that has, you know, that's first of all, can run open source software and that has an OLED display in it, right? At least as far as I'm aware, that's non-existent. So these kind of things are, are stuff that Pine64 kind of pioneered, especially the open source smartwatch, you know, segment. Like they pushed that forward. Open source smartphones, sure, they weren't the first. Like, I mean, obviously there's purism, you know, the elephant in the room there. But they created a huge market for it on them, themselves by releasing inexpensive hardware that had a lot of interesting, you know, features to it that other devices didn't. Yeah, I um, I do actually really think that, I mean, as much as I will talk down on Google Glass and laugh at it, um, I do think that if something like the Pine Glass was announced, I, I definitely think that there are enough people in the community um, who would be interested in that sort of thing and um, would be would actually buy it and want to use it and show it off. I mean, you're going to look dumb using it probably, but, you know, I don't think any of us really care about that. While we're in this mode... Pinecone smart speaker. I know we already have a pinecone, <laughs> but I'll do the voice recordings. I I know I don't really have a voice for a smart speaker, but I'll, I can I can make do when you know we we have just multiple people, multiple multiple members of the community just volunteer their voices for the pinecone smart speaker. We're gonna pretend that the other pinecone doesn't exist. That's the pinecone two now, and you get a smart speaker that's free and open source and is shaped like a pinecone. And I, I already know what you're going to have uh, as your voice lines, right? You're going to be like, this is the pine speaker on a mountain in a secluded monk inhabited <laughs> village. <laughs> yes. So with that out of the way, we're going to wrap up this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed. And also please do give us your thoughts on what we talked about, you know, uh, especially that Google Glass type device. If, if you think that's interesting, then definitely tell us so that, you know, uh, we could go and then poke lucas later and be like hey you know there is interest <laughs> um with that out of the way we're going to end things here if you have any questions you can email us uh the email will be listed in the description i believe it is uh pine talk at pine 64.org and if you have any questions you can leave it in the description if you're watching on youtube or you can send us the matches in the chat rooms on discord for example there's a pine talk discord channel that you can send us messages on there or you could just shoot a, me a message or porky a message straight on discord mine's 33yn2 and his is porky of the pine and um you have anything else to add porky what is it my name's not sally <laughs> <laughs> so with that out of the way we're gonna end this here